Good evening, everybody. My name is E.R. Anderson. I'm the executive director of Keras Circle. Keras Circle is the nonprofit programming arm of Keras Books. And Keras Books is the South's oldest independent feminist bookstore. We are delighted to be here tonight on this very special panel from um, Tor.com and many, many Tor imprints all gathered together, Tor team. Um, and we are especially excited to have this event co-sponsored by our friends at Outlanticon. Atlanticon is Atlanta's LGBTQ plus convention for sci-fi, pop culture, multimedia, and gaming. Their 2022 convention is on, and so I'm going to drop the link that's actually already there. You can check it out. Um, we'd love for you to register and support them, support queer people in gaming, sci-fi, etc. Um, tonight's conversation is Crafting Bold Heroines in Young Adult Fiction, and we have You've been fortunate to assemble an incredible panel for all of you. So I'm going to, since there are five of them, I am going to introduce them as quickly as I can so we can get directly into the show. First, I'm going to introduce Elaine Audrey Becker. Elaine is a storyteller with a passion for history, myth, mountains, and magic. She holds a BA from Vassar College and an MST from the University of Aberdeen. She's worked as an editor at a New York publisher, and she was born and raised in Georgia. We just found out right down the street from Karis Books, which is awesome. Um, her forthcoming book, Forest Born, you can pre-order right now, and we're super excited about that. It's almost here, so get down on it. At the end of tonight, you're going to want to pre-order that one. Next is Charlotte Nicole Davis, who is the critically acclaimed author of The Good Luck Girls. She loves comic book movies and books with maps in the front. A graduate of the New School's Writing for Children's MFA program, she currently lives in Brooklyn, so welcome, Charlotte. Susan Denard is the author of the New York Times bestselling Witchland series, as well as the Something Strange and Deadly series. She has come a long way from small town Georgia, so we're very happy to have another Georgian in the house. Working in marine biology, she got to travel the world six out of seven continents. She'll get to Asia one of these days before she settled down as a full-time novelist and writing instructor. When not writing, she can be found hiking with her dogs, slaying dark spawn on her Xbox, or earning bruises at the dojo. We'll be dropping her website and Instagram in the chat, and in fact, other folks can drop their Instagram handles in the chat as well, if folks want to give, give all of you a follow. Um, Bethany C. Morrow is a recovering expat, recently returning from six years in Montreal, Quebec, to live and write in North Country, New York. A California native, Bethany graduated from the University of California, Santa Cruz, with a BA in sociology. Following undergrad, she studied clinical psychological research at the University of Wales, Bangor, in Great Britain, before returning to North America to focus on her literary work. She is the author of the adult novel Men and the editor of the young adult anthology Take the Mic, as well as several other books we got to celebrate already um, with Bethany once in the pandemic, and we were thrilled to have her back. Shannon Price is a proud Filipina American and Bay Area native. She once led an acapella group for three years despite not knowing how to read music. And she carries that same level of confidence in every area of her life. When not writing, she can be found watching baking shows, exploring old bookstores, and going to the beach as often as she can. A Thousand Fires is her first novel. So we have a great group of folks here tonight. Very grateful to all of you for being here. I'm going to get out of the way. Last thing I'm going to say is if, if our audience members want to ask questions, especially about craft and writing, we would love for you to do that tonight. You can do that by clicking the ask a question button at the bottom center of your screen, or if you want to put it in the chat, I'll be sure to move it over and make sure that our moderator can see it. So welcome, everybody. Thanks so much for being here. All right, thank you, ER, for that introduction. And thanks to everyone we can't see, but we know you're watching. Um, so we have a lot to get through, a lot of people to hear from. So let's just dive right in. Um, hopefully, we have some writers tuning in, in addition to readers, because we're definitely planning to get into the weeds with craft here. But um, before we jump in, let's just dive a little bit into the language. Um, the title of this panel is Crafting Bold Heroines, and that's a phrase that is often used in the book community. I'm sure we've all seen it. Um, I've been lucky enough to hear Bethany speak before about how the fact that often the phrase bold heroine or strong heroine is coded as white. And so I think we could even extend that into a broader observation, which is that this kind of terminology both provides opportunities as well as imposes limitations on 
both authors and their characters. So I'm wondering if to start, whoever would like to answer this question, if you want to just talk a little about your experience with that uh, terminology, good and bad, and how you then uh, translate that experience into your writing. Well, since you quoted me in your... <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> oh, wow, that's a good that's a great quote. <laughs> yeah, no, um, I, will, I will start because, of course, um, writing Black girls and particularly in YA and living in the real world, um, we can't pretend, and thankfully they used my old bio so everybody knows my backgrounds in social and clinical psych, so none of this will come as a surprise. Um, we can't pretend that our imaginations exist or are born in vacuums, right? Um, so the reason something can be coded white, even if you're just saying bold or strong heroine is because the expectation and the allowances for women are very much uh, different across racial identities. Um, so when I came to write, uh, especially Naima in A Chorus Rises, I immediately was confronted with phrasing like unlikable or mean or uh, adversarial or, you know, and it was like, but if I took these traits and wrote them down, isn't this what you guys have been asking for in terms of strong female characters? Um, so my experience was, I mean, it was 100% um, confirmed by by the, the responses, the reactions um, that came because this was a character who was in a previous book. And the entire reason that I wrote a chorus rises following the song below water was because it was like, no, this is completely unacceptable. I, I'm not writing a story with two teenage black girls who everybody considers lovable just to give you an additional black girl to dislike. Like that's not what I was doing. So um, I wrote, I gave her her own story. Number one, to in explicitly not change her, to explicitly not make her more palatable, to explicitly not you know, water it down and make her seem more attractive because I'm challenging the fact that this is allowed, um, that this character would, that people would feel so comfortable saying these really horrible negative things, then who does, who gets to be a strong woman? Who gets to be a bold woman? And for me, as, as a Black woman, being a, and especially as a teenager, being a bold heroine means a big part of what it means, especially for Naima, is not agreeing to the world's definition of yourself not adjusting for the world's definition of yourself. Um, and she has a very strong sense of self-love and it does not change throughout the course of the book, regardless of, of the things that she goes through, regardless of how people treat her. Um, and that's what makes her bold, is, is literally continuing to be strong even when someone tries to use it against you or even when someone tries to um, claim that you don't deserve that kind of strength, despite the fact that they keep banding it around for someone else. That's a really great point. And thank you for jumping in after I put you on the spot. I appreciate that. Um, does anyone else want to weigh in on that before we yeah, move on? Yeah, I'm happy to, because um, this is something I really thought about a lot. Um, so my book, The Sisters of Reckoning, just a very quick, um, I guess, pitch for it. It's the sequel to my first book, The Good Luck Girls. And then the second book, The Sisters of Reckoning, they're both fantasy YAs inspired by the Old West. And it's about this girl gang of outlaws fighting supernatural threats and human threats. And they're just trying to make the world a better place to, to sum it up very quickly. Um, so in making this girl gang, it was really important to me that as many girls as possible felt represented. So when people ask me kind of, you know, what do you want to be the takeaway of this book? I, I always kind of say that there's no wrong way to be a woman. And I hope that's reflected in the characters here. Um, because when we say a strong woman, we have a very specific image in mind. And Bethany is right. that's It's especially coded with Black women, what we expect of them and the ways it's made into a negative thing. Um, so I kind of have Aster, the main character, I wanted to humanize that stereotype of the angry Black woman, the strong Black woman, and show that she is valid for her feelings and that she is human and she deserves a, her happy ending. Um, but I also wanted to show that softness and femininity is strength. We see that in her younger sister. Um, it was really important to me to have someone who looked like me, who was just very masculine. Um, 
in there. That can be a woman if you want to be. Um, there's a trans girl in this book. I really needed it to be very clear that this is a trans inclusive girl gang. Um, and just, you know, other kinds of queerness and racial identities um, and other things that kind of feed into our perception of womanhood and strength. Um, I really wanted to just kind of show that all of those are valid and, you know, you are strong just for being yourself. That was another really helpful perspective. Um, and I feel like we should just dive in from there. Um, so thank you very much for that, Charlotte. Um, all right, let's get into the craft. So when we're building up our characters, a phrase that I have heard a number of authors um, talk about, or I guess a practice that I've heard them talk about is they'll sit down and ask themselves either a question or a set of questions right from the beginning when they're creating characters. Um, it might be, what does this person fear? What do they want? Um, which is something I've always found very interesting because I personally don't start with a set of questions. I more start with um, sort of loose imagery in my mind and getting a sense of who this person is emotionally. Um, and just, you know, the barest introduction to what their emotional arc is gonna look like and what they're building towards and wrestling with. And once I have that foundation, then I'll go back and sort of try to do that more structured process. So turning this question on all of you, when you are at the beginning stages of creating either your heroine or if there's really any character that you wanna talk about, do you tend to start with a specific question or um, a more hard set formula, character to character, or does something else work better for you? Is it more variable character to character? I'll jump in because like, I don't have a good answer. So I feel therefore that I should be messy first. So you guys can come in with more. Not messy. I think that's advice, I'm excellent. The, I, I'm the messy author here, I guess. <laughs> I, I feel like um, uh, Witch Shadow, it was my ninth book to come out. And I feel like not a one of them can I say that I consistently approach the same, which 10 out of 10 don't recommend. I wish that I could say like, man, I have this great method. Um, especially because I have such a popular newsletter for writing advice. Uh, but if you followed me for the 10 years that I've been doing that newsletter, then I feel like you would see how much things have evolved. I Every book is different. Every character seems to come out different. Sometimes I hear their voice really clearly and I discover them as I write. Sometimes I write full drafts. Still don't get them. Toss it out. Try again. And then I'm like, why did I sell this book? So I have to figure it out now. <laughs> um, it wasn't ready to be figured out. But I, 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 and I don't know if it's just the nature of my brain. I do think we all create so very differently. Some people really can sit down and just, um, you know, like people who write IP, they're really good at being handed a set of conditions and then adhering to them. And I can't think of anything that would be harder. Um, I'm so impressed by that. And I, I, I am just that annoying brain that has to wait for the, the voice to come down from the heavens and, and speak to me. And I, I, it's extremely frustrating when you are under deadline. Um, but I will say that over the years, I have learned this about myself where I used to try to fight it and I would try to do the like, okay, maybe if I fill out this character worksheet, I will get them by the end. And then this book will be easy. Uh, that is exactly not what happens. And so instead of fighting that, I have accepted that sometimes books just take a long time to simmer and the characters aren't gonna talk to me yet. They might take longer than I want them to. Um, and sometimes that fire of the deadline is the thing that finally gets them. Like, you're literally out of time, okay. But it it is, it is better to sort of embrace, I think, the way you're particular creativity operates rather than fight it. That is not to say that you shouldn't try lots of things. I'm always trying lots of things. Like, please give me the magic bullet that will that will make this werewolf of a book easier. Uh, and I'm always trying, you know, watching videos, reading books, taking workshops, trying to find something that will jive with my personal style. Um, 
and I, I think it takes a long time to even discover that. I can tell you I still have it, but I, I, yeah, there's my mess of how I find voice, not very easily, um, but I do think voice comes first for me before I can ever write a book. I have to hear them, not, not necessarily know them, just hear them. I have to quickly say that I love actually that you started by saying you don't have a set process because I think um, this is a specific reason why I wanted to toss this question in here is I love the idea of sort of shaking up the narrative a bit that I see, particularly in the writing community, that there's there's one right way to write a book or start your process. So I think it's awesome that uh, I would not call it a mess. <laughs> I think it's just your process and everyone's is different. So, but thank you for going first with that. Uh, who else wants to jump in? I can jump in um, and echoing you. It's such a relief as a, someone who's newer in their career to hear that like Susan, you know, doesn't have a set of questions, right? <laughs> like I can just make it up as I go. Um, mine is very similar. I, um, and like when I get this question, I like feel bad sometimes when I give this answer, but like, it's really a gut feeling. Like I'll be writing someone or writing their dialogue and and how are they, you know, talking to their parent? How are they talking to their best friend? And like, that really starts to shape them for me. Um, and I usually know when it's wrong and I'll, cause I'll like get this feeling. And I'm just like, no, they wouldn't, they wouldn't say that. And I don't know why they wouldn't say that, but like, they wouldn't say that. Um, and so just sort of honoring that voice that you hear. Um, and then also, you know, not discounting other methods, right? Like I love, Susan, you said like you keep trying and you keep learning because I think that alone can help you get there. Like, even if you see a bunch of questions and you're like, okay, this wasn't helpful for me, but it kind of inspired this one little idea. Let me write that down. And then you kind of build from there. Um, I'm also a really visual person. I was like a, an artist or like the artsy kid before I switched to writing. So drawing my characters really helps me or just like doodling them and thinking, you know, what does their hair look like? What do their facial expressions look like? And and that really kind of helps shape um, who they become as a character. Um, for Rowan, who is on the cover here, um, one of the things I always knew about her was that her hair was a particular way. It's braided to her neck and then it flows off of there. And that's been there from like the earliest draft of mine and like, to me, that's part of her personality and like her character because it speaks to the fantasy culture, the society, like the way folks wear their hair has a lot of meaning. And so like that little detail spoke to the character, speaks to the society, speaks to the story, and it all kind of interconnects um, just based on gut feelings and really trusting that characters might change over the course of the story too. And you kind of have to be okay with that sometimes and, and accept that who you set out to write is not who you ended up with, but um, you know, you'll know, and you'll know when you have like found it. And um, yeah, it, 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 it feels good when you get there, but it's so frustrating. I, for my first book, one of the characters, it was almost the last draft, like past pages. And I made a name change because I'm like, that's not his name. Like something about it wasn't working for me. And um, thankfully we, you know, made the change in time and all of a sudden it felt better, but you know, that's just one little thing that it it got that far. And then I'm like, nope, it's different. Let's change it. And um, now it's that's him. That's, that's his name. I, um, I really like the fact that you draw your characters because if I think back to one of the first things, um, especially at Tor, I think that Diana at some point was like, what do these people look like? Like, I feel like that's a normal question for any editor to ask me because I just never, I just never put physical, I I don't think about my characters that way. I, I don't like go through life stopping and looking in mirrors and describing myself to myself. And so I, and so I, I don't know why I've just never, I've just never put a lot of attention into that. And that is something that every editor I feel like has had to say to me, like, can you give me just something? You don't have to, make a portrait, just give me some indication that you know what this person looks like. Um, which you wouldn't be able to tell from my covers because by that time it's like, and it's a lot of hair had to, uh, that's, that was, that's my thing is like, okay, let me figure out her hair and then I'll, and then I'll have a better understanding. But the way that I come to character, I feel like is very much um, concept. Concept is always first to me. So I will get a concept, 
um, sometimes I will get a concept and a character at the same time, which is what happened with the song Below Water. I got Tavia's character, which is a black girl who's a siren in a world where only black girls are sirens. And that told me a ton about the world. And obviously it, it told me exactly who that character was. Um, but Naima, who is the protagonist of Of Chorus Rises, she was in that book. Well, she was in that book from the moment that you're in the scene where she walks in the room. That's that's how Naima came to be as she walked into the room that was, you know, that that Tavia was in. She was in the choir and I knew she was a local. I knew she was the other type of magic that was very, very appreciated and adored. And I knew she was a black girl. So I knew that there was more to her story uh, because of how people would center, she would be taught to center her loconess. But I basically, because concept comes so early, I follow my characters around in that world and, and see how they respond to the world. If I don't know anything about the world, I can't, I can't develop a character. Um, I have to know where they live. I have to know where they're from. Uh, literally, whether it's contemporary, whether it's fantasy, whether it's sci-fi, I need to know the parameters of this world if, I, if I'm ever gonna be able to figure out how they respond to that world. What's their place in that world? How does that world respond to them? So I would say that literally is the way that it happens for me every single time. Um, writing A Chorus Rises was the first time I've really written a follow-up, so it was great because the world already existed. I just had to destroy it and like, or her, like her experience of it and, and how the world treated her completely changed. And that made it really interesting because then it's like, okay, this is the way this world has been shown to operate. This is the way you understand this world. How deep are these changes gonna be? If, if something gets off, off kilter, how far off kilter? And how many people does that impact? And, and where do you see that happen? Where do you see the evidence of that breakdown? Um, which is really, really interesting. Uh, but yeah, I, I have to have the world otherwise, because I, I think that characters should be specific to the worlds that they inhabit. I shouldn't be able to take Naima and put her in, I don't know, the free people colony of so many beginnings that it's coming out next month. Like I shouldn't be able to take my characters and put them in a different world. Otherwise they are not really resultant of the world that they are in and I need them to be. So I think world first for me for character. Yeah, and if there's time for me to jump in, um, something, <laughs> yeah, something new that I've been doing that I found really helpful um, with character building is to try and identify their core emotion because I eventually realized that all of my characters have them. Um, and so it's the sort of idea that there's always underlying a sort of baseline emotion that people feel, you know, unless something is happening to change it, like, you know, your friends throw a surprise party and you're happy or a big dog comes up and you're scared. But when you go back to your normal, it is something. And in the case of these characters, it's usually something negative. And the story is, how did they get that way and how do they heal? So for Aster, her baseline emotion is anger. And whenever I'm stuck, I was like, okay, how would she act in this situation? It's like, okay, I have to remember she's angry. Or it's just like, or how would this affect, in subtle ways that she's not even aware of, how would this affect her interactions with people? It's like, okay, she's angry. You know, she's she doesn't have, she has trust issues. She feels betrayed, like the way that these things feed into all of her little subconscious actions and decisions and the way she talks to people and interacts with people. Um, and that was just like super interesting to me to kind of start thinking of characters in that way. Um, and now that I've sort of got that bug in my ear, I'm doing that as I start my like next thing. And uh, it's been really interesting trying to decide which angsty like baseline emotion describes these characters because you know there's there's multiple answers there's really no wrong answers it's not a science but um yeah it's just been interesting i love that I phrase oh please do sorry no Charlotte i would love for you to there is one thing i do do you guys are right thank you <laughs> i'm a mess uh there is one thing that like even if i have voice that i still can't write the book and that is that until i know the character's desperate desire and I call it their desperate desire because it's the thing that they probably don't need, but that they desperately will do anything for. And so therefore they instigate the plot. So until I have that, I don't have a plot because I don't know what actions they're going to take because I don't know desperately what they want. And oftentimes I might 
I may have sold the book on proposal. So I've told them it was that. And then I get down to write it. And I'm like, it ain't that. So then I have to figure out what the desperate desire actually is. Um, and it has to be desperate. It has to be something that my character is willing to do immoral things in order to get it. That doesn't mean that they're bad, a bad person, but it just means that they would make choices that you, the reader, would probably be like, ooh, that's not going to go well. <laughs> you know it's not. Uh, so that that's sort of just something I thought of based on what you guys were saying. I need that desperate desire. I love that. And uh, as a blanket statement, please tell me to shut up anytime that I am going to cut you off because I I love uh, all these comments. And Charlotte, um, the phrase uh, core emotion is even, I think that's a more articulate way of saying what I was getting at. So thank you for, uh, thank you for that. Um, Susan, you uh, had talked about voice in your answer and Bethany, you spoke about the interplay between characters and world and i think those are both two really important uh aspects of character building that i want to get into um so maybe i'll start with voice and then we'll go to world um but thinking of voice when we are developing our new characters um it's it's another thing where i think the process looks different for everyone um and i know for me it can take it does take a span of really several chapters before I feel like I'm starting to really feel who this character is and learn their unique, specific voice um, once I've been walking around in their shoes for a, a certain amount of time, um, which is great, but then annoying because then I have to go back and revise the earlier chapters to really tease out that new found, oh, this is the voice. Um, so whoever wants to weigh in, is that when you're finding your character's voice um is that something that typically happens quickly for you does it happen early in the drafting process does it take you um the span of several chapters or a draft or you know what have you um to really feel comfortable writing that pov i will uh i will jump in because th i feel like i'm gonna be the messy one here <laughs> um for me, I don't come to the page until I have a first line. And for me, even if it's not, if, if it's, yeah, I, I, I don't like, I don't work it out on the page as much. I do a lot of internal writing before I ever sit down um, because the engine has to be running. You know, like if you jump a car and then it's like, okay, it's, it doesn't last you, you the, because this car actually still needs to work. Like for me, I need to be able to start the engine and go, not, you know, trying to turn it over a million times, uh, trying to get it right. Um, that to me will just be frustrating. So that does happen. It just happens in my head. It doesn't happen at the computer. Um, that would be so frustrating. I, when I watch movies about writers, I'm like, yeah, I wouldn't want to do this either. This looks horribly frustrating and just, super unproductive you're showing people at laptops just like hmm, like that's that would kill me anyway so with voice for me regardless of whether it's first pov or not the pov of the the pov is typically the same in terms of the uh, or the voice is the same for pov and for the character whoever is the is the main character that's the voice that i'm that the entire you know novel is going to be written in and i have to I don't have to, like, I know what it is, but because the person hasn't been on the page, I need to find an exterior representation of it and get into sort of like a trance. This is gonna, this just, I'm not saying anybody else does this, everyone. I'm not saying this is like an artist thing. I'm just saying this is what I do. Um, so music is a huge, huge issue at the beginning of writing for me because I have to find music that matches the tenor of the story to me like that matches and i and if i don't wear headphones i'm sorry to whoever is around me because i'm going to be listening to it you know over and over and over and over and to me it sounds fresh the entire time i know that people in the past have been like i need for you to stop like this is getting <laughs> This is harming me now uh, because I because I really just sort of like nest in it and I really, really meditate on it a lot. I need to I don't like changing. I don't like when the music changes because this is the right sound. 
Like this is the right emotion, this is the right tenor, and I need to stay in this in order to get where I'm trying to go. And once I have that first line, it's typically, I know the first line exactly, but it typically means I have a first chapter. Um, so once I sit down, I do tend to write the entire first chapter up. And I tend to write kind of short first chapters. They tend to be introduction, like literal introductions. Um, and I and I will always stop after I do that to make sure that it came out correctly. I don't, I personally don't do like that. Just write everything and then come back later. Like, my, that's not how my brain works. Um, it's literally like, is this right? Is this what you were trying to do? And as long as that is, okay, now I can now I can go further in the draft, but I can't just, I have to get the voice right. I have to get the world right, I have to get the voice right. And that takes the longest period of time for me because until that's right, it doesn't unlock anything else. I know this is not helping with people who want this to become like a science and for it not to be like a weird eccentric thing, but some of it is weird eccentric stuff. I mean, <laughs> there's nothing we can do about that. Finding voice for me is finding music finding melody, finding pentameter. And that is a very eccentric thing. It's, there's no, there's no formula to it. You just got to search until you find it. I love that so much. I also listen to one song over and over again, but it has usually has nothing to do with what I'm writing. Like I distinctly remember like a love confession. Like someone's like, I love you in my book. And it was like till a Lady Gaga song that came out last year. And it was like, that's, this is what is working for me right now. That's what I'm writing too. Um, well, Bethany, I'm curious actually, are you a panster or a plotter then? Because, or how would you put, where would you put yourself? I am a planter. Okay, so in the middle. <laughs> yeah. So gotcha. I do the first, I do that first thing. I usually can project forward to, I can project forward usually to the climax and potentially the ending, but I have no idea about the first act. So I will project really far and then I'll start following and then I'll stop mm -hmm. again and then I'll fit and then I'll know where certain things are happening. There's a lot of starting and stopping, but it doesn't feel it doesn't feel like a lot of starting and stopping because it's actually very fluid from that point. And then I, I stop mm -hmm. at the major points and read it all the way through to make sure it's accurate. And every time you do that, the end gets sharper and sharper. So yeah, but if I sat down and tried to go like, okay, here, I'm gonna plot this out. And I see people, it's like really detailed. Once I do that, my brain's like, just write the book then. It's like, <laughs> why, are you, why are you writing such like a detailed, outline just write the book so i just write the yeah book. <laughs> i'm with you when i see people and they have those beautiful like post-it boards or like grids and stuff and i'm like i would like i'm already like no like i'm just I'm just gonna do it um but i'm with you i i call myself a panster i think i'm like moving more towards planster vibes but um I, I bring it up because one of the ways i find voice is like the spontaneity of pantsing and just just writing and i think it ties into how I usually am when I am writing. My like most productive times are I'm either uh, first thing in the morning, I've had a ton of coffee and it's just like, it's go time <laughs> or the opposite. And it's like the end of a long work day. I have a day job. So like maybe it's, you know, 9, 10 PM. And I'm so tired that like my brain is just like, we're not going to self edit. We're just going to write. And those are usually my most prolific times. And sometimes that's where I find my character's voice because I'm not, like self-checking myself every step of the way to be like, oh, would he say that though? Like I kind of teed him up to be this character, but like now he's kind of a jerk, but now it's nice again. Like it just like fits the moment. Um, and I find that exciting and fun. Like I completely understand the flip side of like, that's so many dominoes that you're gonna have to go back and revise later. But especially with like a zero draft or like I'm just discovering the story for myself for the first time, um, pantsing and, and just not, having a plan is really helpful so if you're feeling i mean if writers are out there and they're like you're thinking you like must have a plan and like must know everything about your book um you certainly don't i i didn't know where i was going with either of mine and it all worked out so that's my that's my two cents <laughs> yeah i feel like that's a crucial takeaway from this panel which is that there is no one method to the madness we got a little buzzword. There is no one method to uh, writing. Uh, and um, yeah, I love even just hearing about the music that Bethany was talking about, which Shannon, I know you said you also listen to a song over and over again, but it reminded me a little of you saying that you're a visual person and you draw the characters. I just love hearing the sort of 
the non-writing things or, or tools that we pull in. Um, I'm going to ask one more quick question about voice, which is something I find interesting um, and we can just touch on it briefly because we are going to go to world next, which is that um, when I've reflected on uh, voice before and writing POV, it it almost feels like acting in a way to me because, you know, in order to really um, write that person's or that character's perspective as authentically as possible, um, you know, I at least want to really feel like I am sinking into their headspace and walking around in their shoes and feeling, uh, you know, the core emotion and, and, and what they're feeling as much as possible. Um, I'm curious, and I could just be me <laughs> that does this, but do any of you ever find that after a, a heavy or a happy uh, writing session, you you're sort of that character's um, headspace and the emotions that you've been sitting in for a while to really try to make it come out nicely on the page. Um, do you ever walk away from your writing session feeling like you're carrying that with you, either you know emotionally or you just like feel a weight uh, or the opposite? Um, yeah, I can answer that. Um, you know, the Sisters of Reckoning was, I was writing it during 2020 um and it is very much about injustices and revolution and oppression and a lot of things that were just happening in the real world um so it was very hard to have both my work and my real life be the same in that sense um I mean, I do think it's good that the book is relevant there are times when I look at the news and I'd be like spoilers this is happening <laughs> later in the book um but you know it is hard it definitely is hard to um to kind of tackle these heavy things and i always say when i talk about this book that um or the series just in general that it it is supposed to be fun first you know it's this swashbuckling romp through the old west um these are characters who are living out the fantasies that you know queer girls and you know um black girls never usually get to do so they're the ones robbing the banks and in the high speed horse chases um and all these things but i mean there is this undercurrent of the heavier stuff um and since i do have all that in my head and you know all the research i do that feeds into it um yeah it, it is hard to have that in tandem with you know real life stuff happening I think that was a great answer, and um, I'm happy to move on or dwell on this. Who, who, Susan? Please jump in. I just have, I have like a funny story on that, which I realized. <laughs> I'm sorry to follow up with the very um, meaningful thing that you said, Charlotte, with a funny story, but it does have to do with the method acted thing you were saying. So, please, and, like years ago when I was working on the second book in the Witchland series, um, it was like 2015, maybe. I was in a coffee shop working. And this is the last time I ever worked in public because an old man came up to me. I had my headphones in, I'm writing away. He taps me on the shoulder and I pull out my headphones and he was like, you make the best facial expressions. I don't know what you're doing, but it looks fun. And I was like, oh my gosh, my character was in prison. He was escaping. Like, I don't know what kind of face I was making, but I was suddenly, I mean, I was mortified. I was like, I. I was, I have a very expressive face. I'm sure I was all into it as I was typing. So I, I, if I do like pre COVID work in a coffee shop, it's like turn toward the wall so no one can see me. <laughs> oh yeah. I think that's great. We have to have the light and the dark <laughs> and you have just offered both. Um, all right, let's go on to the promised world. Um, Bethany, you brought this up already, um, but there is a lot of interplay when we are creating our characters between the character and then the world around them. Um, you know, it's the same as in real life where our characters are products of the world that they grew up in and also live in, in the present action. 
And then the reverse of that is that the world has to sort of fit their uh, <laughs> what they're dealing with and and inform their um, their stakes or their struggle. You know, the the two entities are really inextricable from one another. Um, so do you tend to start with one versus the other? Do you sort of dip your toes into the character first and then build up the world and then go back to one or the other? Um, do you do the opposite of that? I think Bethany was saying she has to know the world first before, and correct me on that uh, when you answer this if I'm wrong, but I think you were saying you have to build up the world or at least have a sense of it first before you start your character um, development sort of in earnest. So does anyone want to speak to, do you tend to start with one or the other? And then do you toggle between them? Do you really build one up a lot before you go back? You know, they're inextricable, but where do you start between the two? Yeah, I will say that for me, it, that has also changed from book to book, but I tend to write speculative fiction and therefore the world is very specific. Um, and and so I I do have to I have to start with world. Sometimes and I don't mean the whole world. I mean the driving concept basically. So it's the easiest way to do this is with um, my first book, Mem, which was set in an alternate 1920s Montreal in a world where scientists have been able to extract unwanted memories. But when you extract them, they you know, they basically are a clone. We never use the word clone, but they're an exact replica of the person that extracted them and they exist solely to house this memory uh, so, that the, so that the source doesn't have to. Well, in that world, if you are a mem, ostensibly you aren't a, you aren't a sentient person. You just house a particular memory that you live out over and over, mentally live out over and over until it loses its emotional resonance and then you expire. So my main character is a mem who does not follow that. That is not who she is. And that immediately puts her in conflict with the world. It immediately threatens the world that she lives in the system and, and not in a, you know, not in a huge fighting bombing way, but more existentially, it destroys everybody's definitions. This is what a mem is, a mem is not a person. Um, and so as soon as I create, as my, the concept came first, the, the um, extracting unwanted memories, creating a new being who doesn't operate as a being, but who operates as an extension of that. And what does the source lose when you do that? That came first. My another thing that I do if I if I come to something I don't come to a character first, and I come to the world or a concept first, I ask the question: Who's the most interesting person in that world? Well, in that world, the most interesting person is not a human, is not a source. It would be a mem, and it's not a normal mem. It would be a mem. So it's. I think that the, the way that I think about it is why I have such problems with certain types of stories with with like Jurassic Park and like and I love these I absolutely love these but I mean the the Jurassic Park problem is is like you have to find a way to make the most interesting thing in this world fixated on humans for some reason uh because your main characters are humans right so you got to make these things and it, even if it doesn't make any sense even if it's like they've got their own food supply but for some reason they just can't get enough of these tiny insignificant humans um so I <laughs> I, I always want to actually fixate my story on the most interesting person available in that world. And if they're not human, then they shouldn't be human. <laughs> You're ruining <laughs> Jurassic Park for me, Bethany. Okay, I can, I can ruin Little Mermaid. She has the unplumed depths of the ocean, but she sees dude one time and she's like, fuck it, I'm giving up. I'm giving up the ocean. I want this human guy that I don't know. I mean, only a human would write that story, okay? That's all I'm saying. Only a human would write that story. Let's be super careful about our hubris when we come to story building, you guys. Who's the most interesting person in the world that you have conceived of? Follow that person. I feel like the Jurassic Park problem is like a future webinar of yours. Like you can, yeah, that's that's the hook, right? And people will watch it and you give advice on how to avoid it. I would attend. Um, see, for me, um, so The Endless Skies, my book that just came out on Tuesday, is a fantasy. And 
my first book was a contemporary thriller set in San Francisco. So I was really bound obviously by like San Francisco is a real place. Um, and I lived there and I got very nitty gritty down to like, where does the bus, where's the bus route go? And where does, you know, would these two streets connect? That was all for trying to make it real. I think the awesome part about fantasy was there's no, there's no rules, right? Like this is all in my head and I get to craft it how I want. And for me, my characters are um, winged lion shapeshifters. So they have the ability to, to shapeshift into these winged lion forms um, and they're warriors. And so they're, they're fighting the humans who don't shapeshift and they are the enemy. But just that one fact alone, winged lion shapeshifters, like there's a lot there. And so it was probably, it was early on in the writing. I probably had like some idea of the characters, but the world and the city that they live on called the Heliana, which is a floating magical city, right? So it's, it's alone in the sky. And so much about my characters came from thinking really, really critically about what would a society on a magical floating island look like? You know, how many people are there? Are the men and women equal? What do they use for money? What do they eat? How do they dress? Like, there's so many questions for me that came to wanting to create a really believable society and not just like, you know, oh, they're winged lions and that's what they do. Like, that's boring, right? Nobody wants to read about that. But once you introduce like, oh, here's their political structure and here's how kids are raised and here's, you know, how they spend their free time, their work time. Like, it just creates a really um, nuanced world that then informs my characters. And it's like, well, how do my characters then fit into this society? So um, my book has multiple POVs and one of them is from Shireen, who is like, top of her class she's made it all the way to the king's council she's like really succeeded so she's high up there and then another pov is her sister who is just training now to become a warrior she's a warrior elect she's kind of like a senior on their last day of school before graduation like she's basically there um and how how has her life been how is it different from her sister who's like made it through this upper you know echelon of, of um trials to become part of the king's council and so all of that the, the I shaped my characters because I'd shaped my world first. And then there's like this really beautiful exchange of what's logical, what's believable um, and what's interesting because nobody, you know, I don't really need to delve too hard into certain details, but something like, what do they eat? How do they get food on this magical floating island? Like that's a question a reader would ask. So I want to go into there. Um, and so I think balancing that exchange was really fun and something I really enjoyed about fantasy and and not having to look up bus routes on Google Maps. Um, and it was definitely uh, an interplay between the two that that shaped the whole world and ultimately the whole story. Um, I'll be brief because I know we want to get to audience questions, but um, I tend to think of the world as a character and the characters interact with the world and vice versa in very specific ways. Um, so in building a world, I try to think of it in the same kind of deep way I would think of a character. Like I think it's very easy to kind of start with the superficial stuff like, oh, what's, you know, someone's favorite food or how do they dress? Like I feel like that's kind of what you start with in building a world. But you don't really know a person based on those things. You kind of want to go into the deeper stuff like what are they afraid of? What do they want? What are they proud of? And so you kind of think of a world in that sense. So I think of the world of Arqueta, you know, it's this very nationalistic country. It's a relatively young country with something to prove. Um, it's, you know, in a hostile relationship with Aster. Um, so just kind of think of it, thinking of things in these sort of, again, like character type ways, it kind of helped me build the world. I see ER um, in the chat saying, if viewers have questions, now is a great time to ask. So yes, um, please send in your questions and we will go through them. Um, but as we're waiting for that, I <laughs> would love to wrap up um, our discussion and maybe frame it in terms of something that we've touched on a few times in different ways, which is that, again, I think one of the takeaways is that there's really no one right way to write or approach your characters, your world, 
um, you know, so forth, your voice. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons why listening to the range of, of methods that, or lack of methods that people talked about here is really valuable. Um, you know, there are certainly plenty of useful um, tools out there, books and worksheets and websites, um, which are very helpful in, in guiding writers towards, you know, maybe getting started or if they're feeling stuck, guiding them in certain directions. But at the end of the day, we all have our own processes and our own ways that work for us in approaching our writing. And I think, uh, I think it's just really um, valuable to hear what some of those different ways look like and then also just extrapolate that into the broader point that it's okay <laughs> if your method looks different um, than what people are throwing on the gram or something like that. Um, so with that in mind, again, everyone's bringing their own methods, processes to the table. For anyone uh, watching who is not only a reader, but perhaps an aspiring author or a, a writer, do any of you have any sort of advice that you would like to offer from your own perspective, at least, in the way that you approach your character work and developing your characters? I can go first and I will be brief. Um, but it's it's a pet peeve of mine. Like I was waiting for this question so that I could go on my little soapbox about this. Um, but I strongly disagree with the advice that is frequently tossed around that you have to write every day. I think it's trash. I don't think folks should listen to it because it puts a lot of pressure on, especially on newer writers who are like really trying to, to maybe finish up their first book or their second book, you know, and it, it the pressure I think is unhealthy, it's unsustainable, and it's just not realistic. Um, you know, I mentioned before, I have a day job. Sometimes I don't have a lot to do. Sometimes I have a lot to do. You know, I also have a life outside of work and outside of my writing and just balancing all of those things. Um, I never worry about writing every day. Like I will frequently take weeks or months off and focus on reading instead, or maybe I've just got a lot of life going on. So um yeah it's if anybody is like no you must write every day to be a real writer just send them to me i have words for them <laughs> um and don't listen to it like finding what works for you and, and those healthy habits like like for me the waking up early on a saturday or staying up late on a weekday like that is how my books get written and that's fine and that's healthy and that works for me so um yeah don't feel like you have to write every day to be successful it is just untrue yeah, I'm going to, of course, second that because um, I don't have a day job and I don't really have a life out of writing, but I still don't write every day. So <laughs> just to throw that out there. Um, but I also my biggest the biggest thing that I like to to tell people, particularly if you're an aspiring writer, if you're trying to figure out what you want to do and how you want to do it, um, follow your passion, like follow what interests you write, what interests you. Um, and that sounds like common sense, but I am on Twitter enough to know that that is not what a lot of people are being told and that is not what a lot of people are doing. So you can't write, you can't do the business of writing for publication if you don't even like writing. So in order to uh, sort of maintain the whole reason you probably started this, just like I say, like follow the most interesting person in the world, find the most interesting person in your world and write that character, Find the thing that you are most interested in writing and write that, write that first, um, because you're going to eventually have deadlines and all these other things. And the thing that keeps you coming back to the work is enjoying the work, like, <laughs> you know, wanting, wanting to do it. I don't tell p stories that other people want me to tell. I tell stories that I need to tell. I tell stories that I enjoy telling. Um, otherwise, why? Why go through it? It's, uh, it is not all roses. So you know, doing what you actually want to do and love to do and feel inspired to do, A, is gonna help you finish things, um, but B, is gonna help you have the bandwidth to deal with the, the parts of the business that aren't necessarily super fun all the time. Anyone from- I can, uh, I can just chime in. Um, Please do. My 
Uh, I second what they have said. I absolutely agree. I do not write every day. I tried for many, many, many years and many books to be the person who wrote every day. And here's the thing, guys. It took me just as long to write the book as if I hadn't written every day because I wrote crap that I had to delete. And then, uh, or I wrote myself in circles or I just was just, yeah, I was just churning it out to hit my, oh, you've got to write 2,000 words every day or you're not a serious writer. Um, and that's how I wrote many, many drafts of books that got tossed. And on that note though, uh, I think one of the best things you can cultivate as a writer is to be flexible um, and to know that every book, especially if you're in this for the long haul, every book's gonna come out a little different, like babies. Uh, it's just that like, like I, this book, which is the fifth in this series is did not come out like the first or the second or the third. I've had to adapt my strategy with every book because it turns out the deeper you get into a series, the harder it is for certain things. The more this planter has to actually outline and commit. <laughs> and, and it's nothing like um, my new series that starts next year. And that had a its own process. It was first like explored on Twitter with everybody. Uh, I had my first series years and years ago. It was much more just pantsed the whole way through and that worked. But I, I, I feel like you just have to be open to learning new things all the time, to taking advice from other people with a grain of salt, of course. But I think it's really helpful to always be looking at how other people do it and saying, you know, that could work for me. Can't hurt to try it for a few days and see. Um, Cause you never know. You just, you never know. Um, I discovered Maggie Stiefvater's workshop on Etsy, which is a bargain at 50 bucks. And I swear I have like something about that just worked for me for one book. It has never worked since, but it worked for one book and that was worth $50 to me. So I just, I think being flexible and not getting stuck on this is how I worked that time. And so that is how I must do it moving forward. Um, just be willing to always adapt your strategy. So it's a good skill to learn and just to navigate publishing. Publishing is a tough industry and being able to just say, yep, out of my control. I leave this, I leave this to the universe is easier said than done. I've been publishing for 10 years and I still haven't learned it very well, but I feel like I'm better now than I was many years ago. So learning to cultivate that, just go with the flow. This is how this baby wants to be born. All right, that's what we're doing. So that's my advice. A lot of great metaphors being tossed out in this section. That was not sarcasm. I very much enjoy it. Um, I, uh, Charlotte, I definitely do not want to cut you off. Um, no, I just want to say, I see some yeah. questions at the bottom. I don't know if there's time to answer one. Well, I was going to jump in, uh, jump into a couple of them. Maybe it would take like five more minutes um, if, if everyone is okay with that. Um, I see the first one that came in, which is have your main character or main POVs ever changed once you've gotten partway or all the way through your first draft? Shaking of heads. Oh, that one was pretty fast. I, mean, okay. I, I will say yes, in that I completely changed um, point of view. So I went from a third, sorry for the screaming baby. I went from third to first, which um, is more than just changing pronouns. Like you have to actually rewrite the book. It's a totally different lens to view the story. Um, but otherwise, no, I think what Bethany was saying is like you're something drew you to this. And so typically it's that character. It has happened that I might write a few scenes or try to and then be like, ah, no, no, this was not the, the book I thought it would be. And like Bethany, I have now finally learned. She learned, I think, sooner than me. <laughs> Should have. If only I'd known you sooner. I need to wait for that first line. When I Then I know I'm ready to go. Um, but I used to just try to write and write and write, like I said, every day. And, and it didn't work. So I, I do think if it's not exciting you, then it's probably the wrong POV. But if, it, if you love it and it's exciting you, then maybe it is the right POV. It's just there's something else that's not working in the manuscript. I see another one here, which is, uh, I am a planter, and so the revision phase is often grueling. When it comes to tightening pacing in the revision phase, do you have any techniques that work well for you? 
I'm going to jump in on this one. I saw this on the side because when we say pacing, we are not always all talking about the same thing. So a lot of times someone will, it's not a diagnosis, right? Like it's, it's literally just telling you, this is what it feels like is the problem. It doesn't mean it is the problem. Um, sometimes pacing, and especially for me, what I have found pacing issues tend to mean I am not emotionally invested in what your character is doing. And that is very different from saying stuff isn't happening fast enough because you can make a whole bunch of stuff happen, but if I don't care, it doesn't matter. I'm so write this, down. <laughs> this is very good advice. <laughs> so I, I would be really like open to, okay, if, if somebody, if you have a CP or an agent or somebody and they say, hey, you have a pacing problem, that doesn't actually tell you what the problem is. Um, you still need to figure out what is causing it to feel like a pacing problem. Always, I say, always double check your character because that is, even if there are other problems, if people wanna go with your character and if people love your character, they will go with them. Um, so always, always, always uh, double check that it's not a character attachment or, or empathy problem for the reader. You're muted. Time. Me or Elaine? Because I I'm know muted. I'm muted. Yeah. I'm not muted. I'm muted. No, you're on now. Guys, it did not say I was muted. Am I still muted? No, you're no. good. You're good now. I went this <laughs> whole panel without having. Okay, well, I'm sorry. It did not say I was muted. Bethany, no, you're we, waving your we hand we now. I'm the whole panel. Panel. Just right now. You're good. No, you just, just now when you were talking were muted. That's all. <laughs> All right, well, I will definitely not lie awake at night thinking about this moment. Uh, <laughs> let's go to, let's do, uh, one more question, and then ER maybe can come back and close us out. Um, oh, another one just came in. Oh, God, conflict. Um, okay, I see this last one that came in is from someone who hasn't asked a question, so I'm very, very sorry, AJ. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hand it over to Tara's question, which is, do you have advice for balancing a badass heroine's good qualities with their flaws? Can a strong protagonist maintain agency but still need to be quote unquote saved literally or figuratively at certain points of the story? Um, this is a fantastic question. And I think it goes back to our first question about strong characters um, and the ways that sometimes in their effort to be strong, they self-sabotage without realizing. Um, I think that's certainly true for my main character, Aster, who I said is angry and has trust issues. Um, and it does become a problem. Like she's really trying to hold it together and be strong um, and do what she thinks is necessary to protect herself and her loved ones. But she is also rejecting blessings coming her way. You know, there are people trying to help her who, who she doesn't trust to help her or there are people she's not willing to forgive who she would be better off forgiving. Um, and so it's the kind of thing where you have to understand where the character is coming from, but also recognize when they are getting in their own way, as we all do. Um, so that's a great question. I would just add to that, that of course, um, there's a lot that goes into your definition and understanding of what a strong character is and what makes someone strong. And one of the things that we, I know a lot of us have, have paneled before and we've talked about um, getting, and I think Elaine was, uh, was uh, suggesting this at the beginning, sometimes that definition of strong character can be a restriction because we're talking about what we sociologically have accepted as being the way to be strong. And therefore, if the way to be strong is to be independent, um, and to be individualistic, then it would be very hard for that person to be saved without completely destroying the, you know, the image that you've created. So it, it more goes to the nuance of what have you as the author portrayed as strength? Uh, what have you honored as strength? And what does that allow for the character to do and need in the story? Because we a lot of times have to deprogram the messaging that we have ingested before we can do it in the world that we're trying to create. If I have decided that 
um, being strong and fixing everything and having a very sort of like generically masculine approach to strength is the only way to be strong, then yeah, your character's kind of SOL because they can't need anybody. Otherwise they're not strong anymore, right? So it, it's down to you to determine for the reader and for your world, what is strength? What does strength look like? And I just want to say, cause I know you're going to appreciate this Bethany, but Bobby from the expanse is like someone who is like, <laughs> who initially is that like, I can't ask for help. I am strong and therefore doing any, being saved in any way would be in direct opposition to what she is as a person. But over the course of the series, not to spoil anything, that shifts and she's amazing. That's all. <laughs> I feel like that's a great uh, <laughs> note to close out on. Thank you. Um, ER, is it all right if I invite you back into the I was gonna say the chat, which is not right. Please come back on screen. It's kind of a, a, a chat in its own way. Um, <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. Thanks to all of y'all for such good advice, um, actionable advice, which is always like the the gold uh, that people are looking for. So thank you. Um, if folks, if panelists want to put any other links in the chat, um, stuff where folks can find you, your Instagram handles, any newsletters. Um, we have Susan's, so folks should go follow, subscribe to her newsletter, but other stuff too. We would love, um, one of the ways that you can support your favorite writers is by following them on social media. That actually does help in terms of getting future book deals and all that kind of stuff. So follow, encourage your, your fellow fans to follow, and it helps Karis when you buy their books directly from us. So please click this teal button at the bottom of your screen that takes you to the whole page with everybody's books on it. If there is a book that is missing, um, you know, an older book, please just pop their name in there. It will come up. No problem. We also do, of course, carry audiobooks. So if you prefer to read via audiobooks, um, we have a Libro.fm audiobook selection, and many of their books are available as audiobooks. So um, always check that out as well. Um, and finally, I'll be adding captions to this event and putting it up on our YouTube channel. Our YouTube channel is just um, backslash Karis Circle, which is our nonprofit. We would love for you to check out our whole host of events there. Um, and please do share that um, link when it goes out. We'll tweet it out um, because that is more accessible. So thank you all so, so, so much. This was awesome. I got some really good tips. I know our viewers at home did too. I hope that you all stay safe um, during the rest of this pandemic. And maybe one day we can all host you in the real physical space of Karis. Um, and you know, I know some folks are, are really happy to not be having to travel too. So Bethany, you can keep, keep it virtual, but everybody else, if you want to come to Karis, we're glad to have you. Um, and, uh, until next time, I hope that you stay safe and well. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, yeah. Thank you everybody. Thank you.